Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and dear friends, good afternoon to everybody. I would like warmly to welcome you all to today's event, which is titled People Power and Preventing Violent Extremism, What is Working? The uh, event is co-hosted by the U.S. Institute of Peace and the Swiss Federal De Department of Foreign Affairs. Violent extremism has become one of the leading peace and security challenges of our time. Islamic State, Boko Haram, hate-fueled attacks against the Rohingya in Myanmar, white supremacism. These are just a few examples of organizations and activities which displays the uh, complexities of this challenging topic. Too often, efforts to solve the problem of violent extreme, extremism rely only on classic security measures. Experience has shown that such strategies are inadequate and at times can actually fuel further extremism. This has led international organizations and states to adopt a more preventive approach, such as those detailed in the UN Plan of Action to Prevent Violent Extremism. Effective measures, as we see it at IPI, have to have both a hard and a soft dimension. Classic security strategies have been paired with softer measures focused on prevention through education and information, through peace building and sustainable development. For the past several years, IPI has partnered with Switzerland to organize an annual dialogue in, a, in the Sahara Sahel region. The aim of these events have been to explore new ways to address violent extremism. These conversations have brought together key stakeholders to identify and build on preventive efforts that work uh, both at the local, national, regional and international levels. Our experience, supported by, res by research like UNDP's groundbreaking study, Journey to Extremism in Africa, and similar work for USIRP has uh, underscored the importance of human rights and, human and human rights based approaches of, and, uh, in a more inclusive, effective and accountable uh, uh, governance and of connecting efforts to prevent violent extremism with peace building and sustainable development frameworks. Local stakeholders play a critical role in non-violent non approaches. Here it is important to strengthen practices that enable communities to have a stake in their future. Through work with civil society organizations and peace-building efforts, conflict drivers can be uh, addressed and support can be given to those who have left violence behind. It is of critical importance to help people voice their grievances and strengthen their roots in the local community. One of the roles of IPI is to provide a platform for local activists and community members so that they can engage directly with policymakers. The Policy Forum today provides an opportunity to explore how action at the grassroots level can contribute to preventing violent extremism. With these words, let me now turn to Nancy Lindberg, Nancy Lindberg, who is the president of the US Institute of Peace. Then Jake Sherman uh, will put his hands on the helm and moderate the discussion with, I hope, his steady hands. So uh, Nancy, welcome back to uh, IPI, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Terry. Uh, great to see everybody here today, and it's a real pleasure to partner again with IPI uh, and with our Swiss colleagues. Um, thanks to everybody for making it here on a Friday of UNGA Week. This is a really important conversation, and for the U.S. Institute of Peace, this has been an area where we have put a lot of focus as we've seen, I think, as everyone has, the threat that violent extreme, extremism poses to global peace and the way in which it, it exacerbates, it complicates, it prolongs uh, conflict, particularly in states that are the most fragile. Uh, the U.S. Institute of Peace, for those who don't know us, we're Washington-based. We were 
founded by Congress, US Congress, about 35 years ago as a nonpartisan, independent, but national institute. And our mission is very specifically looking at how do you prevent and resolve violent conflict around the world, which we do by working with partners who are on the front lines in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Sudan, South Sudan, Tunisia, um, and so forth. So um, this earlier this year, we re released the report of a task force on preventing uh, violent extremism in fragile states. And this task force had 12 eminent persons who had come from diplomacy, security, and development to look at how, what would it look like for a comprehensive plan for the United States government to address the conditions in fragile states that enable violent extremism to rise, to spread, to take root. Um, and this was based on the realization that we are not going to bomb our way out of this problem. This is not a, a military solution, and that it requires really rethinking how we do this work. Um, and the recommendations, which I invite you to look on our website, um, took a hard look at the way in which the social contract between a government and its people are critical for uh, peace and stability, and also for enabling citizens to be resilient to the siren call of violent extremism. Um, there was a great example I'll just quickly recount in Tunisia of two towns, uh, Sidi Bouzid and Metlawi, similar hardships, social economic conditions. Sidi Bouzid was uh, uh, succumbed to a preacher, a, a hardline violent extremist, uh, ideologue who came into their mosque and recruited many, many fighters who w went off to Syria. That wasn't so in Metlawi. Why? Because they had a long history of labor unions that enabled uh, citizens to organize, to have a voice, to have a way that they could express their concerns and grievances. And this gives us, I think, a really important insight into some of the ways that citizens and people have a critical voice and role in preventing violent extremism. Um, it's about ha having the opportunity to demand the accountability of their government, to demand the freedom and liberty that they seek. We're seeing this around the world right now, from Hong Kong to Khartoum to Venezuela to Moscow. I mean, people are using creative ways of boycotts and sit-ins and marches and the million caller in Iraq, look for that. Um, but this is the power of people. And I'm very excited about the panel that we have today. I'm looking forward to hearing the insights they have of how to move from theory to practice um, and how to explore the kinds of very practical strategies that enable us globally uh, to address the issues of violent extremism. So thank you again. I'm delighted to be here and to partner with IPI. And I think I'm handing it over to you, Jake. Thank you very much, Nancy. Um, before I turn to our panel and introduce our speakers today, I'd like to first invite Mr. Dominic Favre, the um, Deputy Chief of Mission at the Permanent Mission of Switzerland to the United Nations to make some opening remarks. Dominic. Thank you so much. It's true that it's a Friday afternoon during UNGA, but I, I must say that I think this is all about it. No? You, you were saying practice and theory or talks and practice. Uh, here we are with practice, and I think it's important that after such a week we can look ahead to make uh, the world a bit better. I will tell you something about dreams in, in a moment, but uh, thank you so much for, for the invitation. Thank, we are very happy to be here. Uh, always with IPI and with uh, the US Peace Institute, it's really a pleasure to, to working together with all of you. Um, since 2014, as many other states, Switzerland has been involved in, the, in this intense international debate about counterterrorism and the prevention of violent extremism. At the time, the rise of the so-called Islamic State and other militant groups was created creating a lot of fear. Today, this fear is still here. While the Islamic State has not entirely disappeared, in many other places, we have seen the emergence of extremist violence, maybe in different forms and under different names, but it is all around us. But fear is not a good counselor in politics. 
it distracts us from asking ourselves the one central question. Why is it that violence breaks out in our societies? This is the essential meaning of the preventative approach. It starts with a recognition that violence and violent actors are part of our societies and that there are reasons, a wide range of reasons actually, why some men and women, young or not, make a choice for this path of violence. Preventing violent actions takes more than eradicating those committing such violent actions. It actually takes a strong will to eradicate the reasons why violence is committed. What kind of societies do we have to shape for our future? Societies shaped by fear and an escalation of violence or societies shaped around the willingness to build peace and social well-being? It is not forbidden to dream, I was mentioning it, for better lives and of more peaceful societies. And it is exactly what we try to do by supporting initiatives and events like the one today. Hence, my country, Switzerland, alongside efforts by the international community, invests in promoting and in implementing approaches to addressing the root causes and drivers of violent extremism from a preventative perspective. To support this priority commitment, our foreign ministry adopted in April 2016 an action plan of preventing violent extremism. This frames our work at policy level, but also offers guidance for our operational cooperation with our partners in a number of regions and countries. Ladies and gentlemen, working at preventing violent extremism means taking a good look at realities and understanding what is at stake. To do so, we need to include local actors to foster constructive alliances that will fight exclusion and promote collective peace building. This importance of dialogue is at the heart of the PVE programs Switzerland is implementing with its partners in different regions. It is certainly the central pillar of the initiative of the regional conversations that were already, already mentioned for the prevention of violent extremism in the Sahel Sahara, my country has launched in 2016 with partners that include IPI here in New York, but also the CEI DES in Cameroon, whose chairman, Christian Put, is with us today. I'm really looking forward to listening to him. He will be sharing part of the work carried out under this initiative and illustrate why and how dialogue is a key answer to EV and to violence at large. Violence often emerges out of exclusion, marginalization, lack of material pers perspectives or absence of meaningful participation in one society. We believe in dialogue as a tool to address root causes of violence because dialogue offers inclusion, belonging, self-esteem, contributes to putting into place policies and actions which have a lasting impact because they become a collective good. Switzerland will remain mobilized to make prevention a priority of our global agenda, and our peace and security specialists will pursue their daily work with our partners, making dialogue a key to success. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm looking forward to hearing more from our panelists about their experiences to that effect, and I wish you an inspiring discussion. Thank you very much. Dominic, many thanks for that, um, for those opening remarks. I'm going to immediately dive right into the panel. I think uh, all of you have come to hear from them and what they have to say from their own uh, personal experience. It's varied, and uh, judging from the, the initial conversations we had before this started, I think extremely interesting. I, for one, am, am very much looking forward to it. So let me uh, briefly introduce all of our panelists. You have their full bios in front of you in the, uh, the blue participant list, if you're interested. So first, Mr. Aziz Alhamza. He's an award-winning Syrian journalist and co-founder of Raqqa is, being silent, is, Raqqa is Being Slaughtered Silently, a nonpartisan organization that exposes the atrocities committed by ISIS and the Syrian government. Dr. Christian Put is the president of the Centre Africain des Etudes Internationales Diplomatiques, Economiques et Stratégiques in Cameroon. 
Ms. Azaz El Shami is a Sudanese American human rights advocate and independent consultant. Mr. Jesse Morton is the co-founder of Parallel Networks, an organization dedicated to combating violent extremisms and is a former jihadist propagandist. And finally, Ms. Leanne Erdberg is the director of Countering Violent Extremism at the U.S. Institute of Peace, is interim executive director of the Resolve Network, and was a senior advisor to the Task Force on Extremism in Fragile States that Nancy mentioned. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to first turn over to Aziz. Um, he and all of our speakers will have about five minutes, uh, which I'm going to enforce quite ruthlessly so that we have plenty of time for uh, engagement with the audience. So please, Aziz. Yeah, thank you all for coming. So I would start briefly talking about Syria since I'm Syrian. So Syria has been on the news for the last seven, eight, nine years. Everyone was talking about violent and how to stop war in Syria. And until we ended up having ISIS, which is something nobody thought would come after Al-Qaeda. I was meeting with a couple of friends and some politicians, journalists, and we all agreed that, like, not agreed, we were like just making jokes. And we, say, we said like Al-Qaeda is the civil society organization comparing with ISIS. So nobody before like 2011 would think or assume like an organization as bad as ISIS would come and rise up. And the main question, like how we ended up having ISIS. So for me being following so many radical extremism groups, when we talk about like this idea or the ideology of ISIS, it started like long time ago with Taliban turned to Al Qaeda, ended up to Islamic State in Iraq, eventually ISIS, Islamic State in Syria and Iraq, not only Syria and Iraq. Right now we find it in, there is Boko Haram in Nigeria, there is like in Egypt, almost in so many countries. So, and when we talk about the point or like the level why we got to have ISIS, it's all started because of the ideology and the actions of the international world, the international community. So when we talk about Afghanistan or Syria or other countries, so they would like uh, create collagens to go and bomb that areas. And I'm not saying I'm 100% against, against the military solution. In some situation, you can make peace with ISIS, so you need to use like military solution. But the military solution wasn't planned so well. And the main thing, what's after defeating ISIS? What's after defeating Al-Qaeda? When we talk about Syria, when we talk about Raqqa, like, during the like, Raqqa campaign, which was three months or almost like four months, about 16 to 1,700 people got killed regarding amnesty. 80% of the city, 80% of Raqqa has, have been destroyed. So we were just talking before getting here, like how people would survive, how, can, how you can talk with people about peace when there is like a completely destroyed city, there was a seal on the streets, nobody want to help. Like we've heard like speeches, promises from the international community. We would help rebuilding Raqqa, but there is nothing. There is some money coming. It would be going to militias and this militias would take that money and nothing on the ground. So you can't talk with people be like talking with them about peace and uh, to forget everything when they have like a completely like <coughs> dis destruction, they have like destroyed buildings. So I have team, I work with Syrians all over, like all over the country from in different cities. And I also work with some Iraqi activists in Iraq. So when we try to push any project or anything as civil society, and uh, we would find like the militias in, in like in our face, you can do that, you can talk politics, you can criticize us, you can do that and this, which is a huge problem. When you go to the international community, Oh, like, okay, these cities are destroyed. Like, do you want to help, like, and support the civil so society organization? They would say, uh, we're afraid, like, to send money to Syria. It's, like, so risky. We don't know where the money will go. So everyone would come with an excuse. So the main thing that I had, like, known that, pe like, governments, after destroying things or having, like, comebacks all battles to defeat ISIS or other groups, they would leave those cities alone, which is a, a big problem. So my team, like when they work on ground, they took, like so many kids would ask them, 
where is ISIS? We miss ISIS. So we need to work with those kids. They haven't been to schools for four or five years, and right now there is no schools. So we tried like to do more education things, and it was like the problem fund, as I talked. But again, like no one would focus on that geology. So I'm afraid that we might have something like worse than ISIS in the future, and like we would have this joke again uh, that ISIS would be like a civil society organization comparing with the new like group that would rise up. So again, in order to defeat like extremism, violence, we need to fight against the ideology, which can't be solved by, which can be solved by uh, bombs, airstrikes. Thank you. Thanks very much, Aziz. I think, you know, two points that you raised. One, mil the fact that it's often military action that actually has the un unintended result of furthering the very thing that it's meant to address. And the UNDP study, for example, that Terrier had mentioned found that something like seven in 10 people who had joined radical groups actually became radicalized after they had had contact with uh, state security forces. So I think very important for, for all of us to think about um, how we, we break that cycle. And I, I also like the point you made about the risk of uh, leaving issues of, of exclusion and marginalization untouched and how that actually sows the, start, starts the cycle all over again. Um, with that, I'm now going to turn to uh, Christian, who I believe is going to talk about the Lake Chad Basin. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to thank the organizers to inv for inviting uh, us right from Cameroon to be here with you. Um, I am part of an initiative which is called uh, the Initiative of Regional Conversation for uh, PV in Africa, which is led by IPI, Switzerland, and United Nations. And uh, our focus as CEDES is Lake Chad Basin. Uh, so Lake Chad Basin is made of four countries, Niger, Nigeria, Cameroon, and Chad. And uh, within the framework of the multinational joint tax force, they have been joined by Benin and some partner country. We are helping them on the military side. But the efforts all those countries gathered together with their armies are doing are not really much improving. As you know, from 2009 and 2019, it is now almost uh, more than 10 years that Boko Haram is uh, ravaging uh, the Lake Chad Basin area with a lot of consequences. So we start our work with analyzing the situation, understanding the push factors and the pull factors. And then um, we understood that what is very important in the matrix of um, trying to set up a preventive mechanism is a uh, fight against um, exclusion. Because the area where Boko Haram operates is remote area. When you are in, um, when you are in Difa, for instance in Niger, you are 1,050 kilometers far from Niamey, which is the capital of Niger. It is almost the same thing when you are in Marwa, in Cameroon. It is the far north region, and there you don't feel the presence of the states. So um, how to isolate the, how to, how to deal with this uh, exclusion, which is the matrix of, uh, of, of, of the, 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 the people joining uh, the extremist group. We decided to put in place uh, what we call dialogue and conversation. And we witnessed two things. Um, there was lack, there is, there is, there is this, um, there is this poor governance, govern, governance which is already acknowledged by a lot of studies, but it is also um, this social contract which is not working. But what we, dis we discovered, putting people around tables, is that you have, even at a local level, um, the, the, the senior division officer, um, the, 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 the general commanding the troops in that area, and people from the civil society, they have never g been given the opportunity to sit up together and, and try to reflect on what kind of responses can we, at our level, put together to address the situation we are witnessing. The, the, the headmaster of a school, um, the people from the Ministry of, uh, of Youth at a local level, they have not been within the framework of this crisis. While we are go going for meetings in all parts of the world, they have never been given the opportunity to sit together and to reflect at a very local level what they can do. And this is the opportunity this uh, program uh, offered to, to those people. So we have had several meetings. And we are also focused on this uh, 
on this issue of the security and defense forces because one of the partners we have in this initiative is the Center for uh, Defense and uh, Security Studies of Senegal. So there are now several partners in this initiative and uh, the, 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 the role of defense and security forces is very important in our activities. We always make sure we have them around on board uh, when we, 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 we put down the conversation. And we have had very important results. And these results today is that um, almost is a community of 1,000 people in all uh, the two regions, um, West Africa and Central Africa, has been put together at regional, sub-regional, national and local level, and they are now uh, feeling less isolated and looking for ideas to, to, be, to build resilient communities. This has worked and uh, a lot of our outcomes have been shared during the governor's meeting in, in 2018 and in 2019. And uh, I think uh, we can continue the conversation with, if you have a uh, further question. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. I, I, I like the point you raised in, in your project, creating space for communities to actually have a say in what the responses look like. Because I think very often it's the case, and we see this not just in the Lake Chad Basin, but throughout many regions where violent extremism is seen as a security threat, that the approach tends to be very top-down and, and often a, a, a bit of a cookie-cutter approach without a real understanding of uh, what the local drivers are and, and without that opportunity. So thanks for that. I hope an issue that we can come back to uh, in the discussion. I'm now going to turn to Azaz uh, to talk about her own work uh, on Sudan watch to make sure that I don't run over the time. <laughs> and if you would excuse me, I'll read from my papers because I know I can go on a tangent. So I'll just to make my, myself on track. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I'm going to talk about Sudan. So how it started, it's very interestingly that today, the 27th of September, actually marks the sixth uh, anniversary of one of the largest protests that took place in Sudan in the recent history. Uh, people came to the streets, they were protesting, and at least 200 of them were killed within three days. Uh, and between September 2013 and December 2018, a lot had happened. And it's, I think that tragic moment and that tragic experience was actually like the heating or the warming up to what we saw in December. Uh, talking to a lot of activists on the ground, a lot of the uh, tragedies and a lot of the experiences and the lesson learned from this, uh, September 2013 were addressed and it was always at the back of their brain when they were planning any next event. Uh, and it came very evident that the grassroots started to realize the importance of working as collective and, and have more organization and become like more nonviolent uh, struggle in the disobedience that took place in 2016. So if you watch it, it, it's not what I would like everybody to understand is like the nonviolent resistance is not something that you can force on people. It's something very organic and it's very incremental and it takes its time to grow. And sometimes after very harsh setback is that when they actually come back more mature and more aware of what works and whatnot. When it came to, so since the September of 2013, since then they started to understand is that going to uh, um, uh, central places like a square, like what happened in Egypt would not work in Sudan. We don't have that urban planning in Sudan. It does not work. So, and you are coming to invade other people's space where they feel like they're going to be at the receiving end of the government crackdown. So they're not going to be participating with you. They're not going to give you any prote protection. So they went back to the drawing board and they said, you know what? Let's start with neighborhoods. And that's what they did. They started with neighborhood committees. And that was like, had a lot of like very fluid uh, structure that was not very clear, but it started to learn learn. And what this gave the youth, because most of them, they were youth, it gave them purpose. It not only just 
and it gave them this sense of agency. And it was really interesting to see how youth was very apathetic and completely not interested in changing the, the politics and completely uh, talking and the hashtag that were trending at some times were very offensive to Sudan and being a hopeless place. And it was really interesting when I talked to someone uh, recently from the youth, they told me two striking things. One is that we never been proud of being Sudanese as we are now. And it was really interesting because it was right at the heel, on the heel of him crying about the martyrs being killed. And you would expect that such pain would make them lose faith or look the other way around. No, it made them proud and it gave this social accountability on, on their conscience that we owe it to the people who died. We owe it to them that we realize their dreams and to bring it. And the second striking um, statement, it was redefining masculinity. And anyone who understands Sudan or the Africa in general, masculinity is a very, it's an undermining, like it's an underlining uh, drive for a lot of conflict. And it was really, and I told him, what do you mean? He's like, being a man, in the stronger sense, it's no longer about being ruthless or being strong physically or armed. It became actually about being um, uh, morally guided, uh, have uh, more being selfless, uh, and and having this sacrifice. Um, last week, there was a, a beautiful um, inauguration of a, of. A, of a statue of Abdul Azim who died in Sudan. And he was killed doing this and unarmed, and he died. And his death, it just, it, it was this amazing spirit that washed everybody about the importance of being nonviolent and, and what it means and dignifies them. I've been told that I have a minute, <laughs> so I'm gonna rush real quick about things that I would like you to um, take with you. So um, what is next? Um, I want to tell you, like, there is something about nonviolent resistance that it's actually like a school. It's a college. You learn so much. For you to have 11, like, 100 people on the street means that you talk to them, means that you convince them, means that you, trust, you built trust. That means you had a goal. You had calculated, a lot of people calculated that their risk is that the benefit of them joining this cause is higher than the risk that they could face. That's very important, and that takes a lot. And you would see how that was very significant when the internet was shut down in Sudan for 35 days. Nobody expected that you would have a one million marches, uh, march in Sudan on the 30th of June, when the internet was shut already for 27 days, and it's still people came. Because it's no longer about clicks, it's no longer about tweets, it's no longer about Facebook, it's about people to people, and they have seen. And the more blood is spled, spelled of them, the more committed they become to, to this struggle. I have dark scenarios that I can get into because people are still protesting, but it's not for a price of bread. It's not about the price of gas. They're protesting for justice. So the same fuel that was fueling people's is, is demand to get to the streets and remain peaceful could be the reason for them to go otherwise because you are creating new oppressive circumstances and that needs to be addressed and I can get into that later. I'm sorry, thank you. Thanks so much, Azaz. I mean, it, you know, it goes without saying, when you, when you moderate an event, sometimes five minutes seems interminable. <laughs> and I think it's clear that so far, and I'm confident the trend will continue with our next two speakers, that five minutes seems far, far too short. And I actually feel like I'm, in some ways, cutting off uh, quite interesting discussion. But again, we'll have plenty of time for, for Q&A. So I want to I wanna thank you for for your brevity. Um, let me now turn to you, uh, Jesse. Thank you for having me. Um, I guess one thing I am thinking about as I sit on stage, I started an organization called Parallel Networks because I feel like one thing that I learned, as was mentioned in the introduction, from being a very prominent radicalizer and recruiter on behalf of Al-Qaeda from 2003 till 2011 was that jihadist and extremist organizations know how to think in terms of network structures and how to build a brand and a movement as opposed to some of the things that we incorrectly do when we reach out and try to uh, uh, react to them. So I think also another point, I'll share a bit of my personal story before I talk about how we sort of apply what we're learning in the realm of 
peace building uh, and try to insert some of those principles into the realm of countering violent extremism domestically because the United States increasingly looks like what we used to refer to as a developing country. Um, and so we're doing this work at home. But my story is a long one. I came from a very seriously uh, traumatic upbringing, a lot of child abuse in the house. And I guess my conversion into understanding that I was supposed to sell, sacrifice myself for another was when my mother would turn toward my sister and try to beat her and I would intervene and ask my mother to beat me instead. And when I started to get older and I went to my community and I asked the community to intervene and to help, back then there was no mandated reporter status so no one did much and at 16 I had to run away because I felt like things were going to get out of control. I ran away and long story short I became one of the, um, I converted to Islam and I became a very effective radicalizer and recruiter. A lot of the templates and a lot of the jihadi cool that you see was um, a product of my work with some associates here in, in the United States. It is not an ISIS import. It is an American export. I can tell you that for sure uh, with regard to its attraction to the Western populations. Um, so anyway, uh, one of the things my organization did that crossed the line of the First Amendment was I threatened the writers of South Park for portraying the Prophet Muhammad in a bear costume or portraying the Prophet Muhammad in a sacrilegious way, however you want to look at that. And I ran to Morocco. I ran to Morocco in 2010. And I get to Morocco, and I'm this fundamentalist extremist who's running this website called revolutionmuslim.com. It's going viral. It's connected to 15 different terrorist plots. And all of a sudden, I'm extracted from the network that I belong to. And I'm sitting in Morocco, and this great thing happens called the Arab Spring. So I'm teaching these Arab millennial youth how to study for their GRE and their GMAT so that I can survive. And I'm interacting with these invigorated and emboldened and hopeful youth. And the energy just starts to affect me. I'd be a liar if I said it didn't. Plus, I was removed. So the very first seed and cast of doubt was in the context of hope for democracy. And I think that when we think in terms of networks and we heard a narrative that for me was like that was returning me to that moment where there was hope and where there was a cultivation of an ability to have hope for the future. I was ultimately arrested in Casablanca in uh, Salafi Jihadi Mosque and I was put in incarceration for five months in Morocco where I met one of my ideologues. His name was Mohammed Fizazi, a very famous Jihadi preacher. What wasn't known was that he would soon be released from prison and write op-eds in the Moroccan state press that were about his de-radicalization. And I saw that a former extremist could make amends because I was facing life in prison. I was flown home, housed for 23 hours a day in an American prison in isolation, and a kind guard would take me to the upstairs of the facility for four days a week, 10-hour shifts, where I was left alone with the Encyclopedia Britannica's great books of the Western world and the words of Thomas Paine and Western philosophers. And then I'd go back to the cell for three days a week when I couldn't get out, and I'd read Hadith and Quran through a post-Enlightenment understanding. And I started to transition. So when the FBI came to meet me, I no longer saw the FBI as my enemy. And I was willing to cooperate because my students started to appear. I was arrested three weeks after Osama bin Laden was killed. And everyone thought the war on terror was over. Um, as I sat in that cell for those nine months in solitary, conditions on the ground changed, particularly in Syria. And now my students started showing up. And they were virtual plotters and entrepreneurs operating online in clandestine ways, in ways that we had never imagined. So today, I work with the NYPD Director of Intelligence that created an entire unit in the NYPD to monitor my activity. And we partner together to combat violent extremism, both abroad but predominantly interested in establishing an ecosystemic network-based approach here at home. And um, we engage in an array of different activity that ranges from prevention to intervention to counter-narrative campaigns to recidivism reduction to at every level. And they all intersect, and I think it's important. Because a lot of times what we try to do, we try to address one initiative or one piece of the radicalization puzzle. And we always want to look at why people go on to become violent extremists. But I think when you listen to stories like this one of transformation and others of people that never entered into the movements but were affected and impacted by them and were able to overcome and do something about them, is that these are holistic, comprehensive worldviews and movements that formulate uh, as a result of being built on principles that are antithetical to those of violent extremism itself. And I think that we have to think in terms of, I basically do this for a living now, is I sit back and I reverse engineer what I intuitively knew. And I look at science and I look at what we're learning from fields like network theory and um, epidemiology. And, 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 I, and I see the same structures are existent. So I'm very hopeful and I'm very honored uh, by being able to be here to share a piece of my story with you guys today. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. It's really an incredible...
incredibly inspiring story, and I, I mean, listening to you, I, I, I hope that everything that made you a successful recruiter for Dadaism is now making you as successful in, in working against it. Um, finally, uh, Leanne, let me turn to you. Rule number one of working with Jesse is never follow Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> So I have the unlucky task of doing so. No, I'm delighted to be able to be the last speaker, and I won't hold uh, too much time between us and questions. But um, as part of our collaboration with Jake was this brainchild that my colleague Maria Stefan, the scholar on nonviolent resistance, and I have been working on for some time, which is to try and better understand what are the facets of being part of a nonviolent action, nonviolent resistance movement that are also the same as being part of a violent extremist or terrorist organization. And it brought me back to some work that I had done about five years ago when I still worked for the U.S. government. And I had been doing a comprehensive literature review on all of the different pieces of research that looked at violent extremism. And at the time, there wasn't that much. Now there's tons more, thanks to networks like the Resolve Network and a variety of other scholars. But at the time, I was really struggling for some, some type of unifying archetype or concepts that would make sense of all these disparate pieces of scholarship. And I ended up circling around Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And this is an American psychologist who said that all humans have this hierarchy of needs, at the bottom being your physiological needs like food and water, then moving to your safety needs. After that, you move to your needs for love and belonging, eventually self-esteem, and at the highest level, self-actualization. And what I was realizing is violent extremist groups and terrorist groups were they were opportunistic. Whatever your need was at the very bottom toward the very top, they were going to be able to find that and tailor that their radical change was the answer to whatever your deficiency and needs was. And so they didn't necessarily always have the same archetype. It was adaptive. It was flexible. It was able to take people from all walks of life in so many different contexts and bring it into this radical narrative that basically said there is an illegitimate status quo and my way is the best way to get you to a better life. So what we were seeing was that and terrorist organizations, perhaps with knowing it, perhaps without knowing it, were operating on three very different levels of trying to do radicalization and recruitment. The first was an individual level, the second is at a group level, and the third is at a structural level. And this is some of the thinking that has informed how we're looking at nonviolent action and nonviolent resistance. So at, at an individual level, we're working with a group of neuroscientists who have come to find that there are these, part, there are these things called sacred values. These are moral values that are non-negotiable and inviable. They can be religious, but they also can be secular. But basically, the idea of a sacred value is that it is something that you are willing to not negotiate under any circumstances. Why is this important? It is processed in a different part of your brain than cost-benefit analysis. And so when we think about sacred values, when, then when these neuroscientists were able to put violent extremists into an MRI scanner, they were able to see that it is processed in a sacred values are processed in a different part of your brain. Brain. So the individual level matters, how they feel about a specific cause. The second is the group identity level. So there are countless studies that show that we do things in groups that we are unwilling to do alone. There are tons of studies through basically over 100 years of scholarship that show that we are able to do things in groups, um, regardless of if we have a basis for what we are doing, we're willing to do it when we do it with one another. I think this is an incredibly important level of understanding as well. And the last is the structural level. Level. So it, it's fitting that we're here at the UN General Assembly meetings and understanding that the structural level matters. There are decisions that are outside of your individual or your group's ability to impact. There are things that take much larger bits of collective action in a systemic way to understand how the world works and what your left and right boundaries are. What's interesting about nonviolent action and how, how nonviolent action can fill a lot of the same psychosocial group level and structural level needs is that it is answering a collective action call and it's needed to change the big stuff on the structural level. It's providing the group and the bonds of belonging uh, that happen only when you're able to struggle together. And it is fulfilling some of those individual level characteristics regarding sacred values and the things that you believe to be inviolable, like freedom or dignity or liberty or democracy, whatever it might be. 
What's also interesting about nonviolent action, and, um, and my, my friend and scholar Maria has taught me a lot about this, is that it not only is nonviolent action twice as effective as violent armed struggle in achieving its goals, but over the long term, it provides a runway toward democratization, that people are actually part of the process of change and not just part of a moment in time. I think that there is a big part about that, that success rate that enables people to be part of a winning team. If you know that your means of nonviolent struggle is more likely to actually um, upend that illegitimate status quo, then there is a, a willingness to be part of that team and to want to be on the winning team and have bigger and broader swaths of society join into that type of nonviolent action. What's also interesting about it is that almost every culture around the world has some sort of history of nonviolent action. And so we often think of our histories as, as dotted over time with some of the armed struggles, but almost every culture has an individual way of nonviolent action being part of their cultural her her heritage as well. So all of this is part of a wider humanistic lens that we're trying to take at USIP with many partners um, to think about how we can learn more um, be between violent extremism and preventing um, violent extremist groups from radicalizing and recruiting in the way in which they have at the individual level, at the group level, and at the structural level. We are still partnering with those neuroscientists that I mentioned, and we are looking to be able to see um, at an individual level if what is happening in your brain as part of a nonviolent resistance movement does look the same as what's in your brain as part of a violent extremist group. So stay tuned for that research, hopefully next year. And with that, very excited to be part of the Q&A session. Thank you. Thanks very much, Leanne. And I actually, I'm going to put in a plug for those of you who are interested and intrigued by some of what uh, Leanne talked about. Several months ago, IPI and USIP hosted a, a panel discussion similarly on issues of, of preventing violent extremism. Maria was on that panel. And one of the neuroscientists that they've been working with, uh, Mike Nickenchuk, who has an excellent presentation, and it comes with a, a, a really good slide presentation. So that's on our website if, if you're interested. Um, with that, I'm going to open things up for question and answers. Um, we have about 40 minutes for discussion. There's a microphone here and a microphone in the back. Uh, one of the quirks of the General Assembly is that there's a jammer parked right on First <laughs> Avenue, so our wireless microphones aren't working. So I would invite you to come up uh, to whichever microphone is, is closer. We'll take a group of questions, and, uh, and then we'll turn back to the, the panelists. Nobody no has questions. any questions. That's amazing. <laughs> Please, yeah. And there's a there's a button on the front that you've got to push. Hi, this is John Bellamini. My question to the panel is: What do you need today from us to be successful in your mission? Please. Uh, my question is to Mr. Martin. My name is Mohammed Abu Bakr. Um, I'm from Sudan, and um, terrorist groups, as you have been on the receiving end of uh, their recruitment, are obviously very brilliant at exploiting that part of your identity, that vulnerability in your, um, in your identity, and that uh, fragile part of your history. Are we, as civil society organizations, uh, working on PVE, getting even better at the game of, uh, of combating that effectively. Um, because like I've been to so many uh, PVE, CVE around Europe and the United States, and it's, it's hard not to get cynical after a while because obviously we're not doing good enough. And um, I was wondering from your perspective, as someone who has been on the receiving end of this, are we getting better? Our, our, is our game improving at least, if not you know, effective? So, um, I, any other questions? Or? That's all right. Yeah, please. We'll take this one and then, and then we'll come back to the panel. And Jesse, I'll start with you. Hello, I'm Kami. I'm from India. And I had a question for uh, Mr. Morton. I just 
wasn't clear if I, I heard correctly because of the fans. Did you say the turning point when you um, kind of decided that you want you want to have a shift in, in what you do and your, your beliefs? Was it your students and your and their reaction to your teaching? That's it. All right, great. So why don't we come back to the panel, Jesse? There were a, a couple of questions directed at you, but you know others. Feel free to jump in. So, please. so first question: What do we need uh, domestically? We need uh, people to raise awareness that we have as much of a need to combat polarization, hate, and extremism in this country as we do elsewhere. Uh, there is no government funding. We spend several million dollars each year on funding stuff abroad. We don't spend any money. Uh, here domestically, and when we do, we don't really know what we're doing. We need uh, the philanthropic and the financial sector to get more involved, the corporate sector to get more involved, and we need to get money to people that know how to make it move quickly, because government bureaucracy is a big hindrance. Um, and then uh, with regard to your question about, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've worked with the same crowds, and it can get depressing, but I think it's interesting because, you know, you, you, you learn by trial and error. And a lot of times those conversations and those panels are just to talk for the sake of talking sometimes, but it's those moments when um, there's a connection that's a necessary connection where that proper uh, uh, communication can be conveyed. So it's important to meet so that magic can happen, so to say. But with regard, we have to, do more, to change how we think. Like even if you look at the six principles of the Martin Luther King Institute on how to formulate nonviolent resistance, it starts with this rational assessment of the problem. Like we assume people are rational actors and. We don't understand what Leon's saying, we're not. So the traumatized brain that's susceptible to extremism thinks in the amygdala realm, which is your emotional part, and you can't get into consciousness and pass through to the prefrontal context, cortex where you're rational until you learn how to overcome that fight, flight, freeze where the traumatized individual sits. And then terrorist organizations that grow big enough, they traumatize entire populations. So they create their own, they regenerate those that are susceptible and vulnerable. And so we have to learn how to communicate and to message. And the way we do that is we learn how to formulate knowledge Nonviolent alternatives that the violent extremists propose, but they have to be conveyed in a way that's coherent and offer a coherent worldview, both on antithetical principles and values to those extremists to provide their recruits. And my de-radicalization, the seed was planted. De-radicalization is a process, it's not an event. That's clear for everyone. The seed was planted in my interaction with one Moroccan uh, millennial uh, Arab youth. She was really bright and so passionate about getting to the West. And she looked at me and she said, what in the hell do you want to be in Morocco for? And I said, what in the hell do you want to go to the West for where you're going to lose your religion? And then we started to have this conversation where we'd meet at cafes. And after I would teach her GRE and GMAT, we would talk about hopes and aspirations for the future. And I realized that the things I had taken for granted my whole life were stunting this genius's opportunity to express herself and to do justice to her own society. And that was the beginning. Thanks, Jesse. What, um, why don't we just work down the line, Christian, if, if you want to respond to anything. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the question was, what do we need? Because perhaps before saying what we still need, we have to, to be grateful for what is already done. Um, by Switzerland and by the other partners around this initiative. But I think we need to cascade it and to expand it in the whole um, areas that are concerned by this uh, PVE, uh, by this extre ex um, violent extremism. Because what we have seen in uh, Western Central Africa, for instance, is that a, a region like, like uh, countries like Burkina Faso, um, Togo, and perhaps tomorrow Benin were not uh, at the first uh, touched by the phenomenon of violent extremism are are coming are becoming countries where uh, extremists are also now operating and I think we need to put a lot of people around the conversation and uh, try to dialogue a lot with uh, those who can address this uh, violence at the local community and try to link them with uh, people who have the decision at the national and international level. And for that, we need, of course, um, commitments and we need means. Yeah, so I think I talked about it when I was talking first. So I would say first we need to cut the military budget, put it more in, into education. In the, education is a key. And again, like for me, extremism is an ideology, not a military group. You can defeat a militia today, have another one in two years or like two days. So and again, like for me, studying like so many foreign fighters who went and joined ISIS. So they were foreign fighters joined ISIS from more than 84 countries. And I was just trying to understand the mentality, how they joined. So I was able to meet with their families, people that they know them. And there are several reasons. So 
not everyone who went and joined ISIS 100% believed in ISIS. So many people faced racism, faced like hard times. They were homeless in their countries. They were not accepted by the society. So they found ISIS as a key. So many people, like they were like in the street and they went and joined ISIS, ended up having like salaries, cars. So many people, they were like depressed, they were abused. They went to ISIS and they turned to be leaders. So there is like a short story that German robber, his name is Abu Talha al Almani. I don't know how to say it in English or in German. So he was like a robber, like singing in the street, fighting, wearing anti Islam shirts. And he went and joined ISIS. And um, because he got jailed like so many times, he was in the street. And we went, and when he went and joined ISIS, all what he was doing is taking selfies. And when I, I was living in Germany, and when I would try to read German newspaper, the first page was like Abu Talha taking a selfie. So all the Germans knew about him because of him taking selfies. So, and he started singing for ISIS, and he started like just cutting heads. So he went like to impose like this, like powerful thing that he was missing so i would say like in this situation like we need to work with communities like in the local countries so not only like in syria or the middle east or what they call the third world or mina or whatever everywhere so there are problems everywhere starting from this country here in the u.s talking about europe and i would say like more, working like more on the security so I've also like met with a family with a German girl. She was 14 or 15 at the time when she went and joined ISIS. And she joined ISIS because her friend went and joined with her family. And her friend was telling her, like, come here. Nobody would tell us to sleep after 10. You know, we can play as long as we want. There is no school. There is no education. And when she left Germany, nobody stopped her. She flew to Turkey, 15 years old, by herself. Nobody stopped her, like, where you're going, you know? So... I would say like just like I'm not I'm not saying like close the borders of course I'm against borders so but the idea like don't let 15 years old girl or guy or whoever flying by him or herself without a permission without a parents and not leaving the country or the EU she went to Turkey like to another continent so and joined ISIS there are like thousands of examples but I would say like starting with the community and focusing more on, ed on education and awareness So um, what do we need today to be successful? I'll go with three things. Um, the first is, I think, a much more behavioral approach to how people actually work. The behavioral economics uh, took decades to catch on, but eventually we started to realize that people are not rational actors and they often make decisions that are against their self-interest. We still haven't progressed there in some of the, the work that we're doing in this space. And so we're still highly rational about the why people join, and we have to actually embrace far more of the irrational and emotional and group dynamics and some of the things that we'll never be able to see. You won't be able to deduce back and then be able to all of a sudden have the exact right intervention that addresses the deductive reasoning of the thing before it. So that actually demands a ton more space for bottom-up instead of top-down level approaches. And so I still think that far too much of our funding that is looking to address preventing violent extremism is dictated in capitals with objectives and goals that are dictated by governments. And so those objectives and goals, by delegating them down to, to the grassroots level, allowing people to redefine what it is that their objectives are, what is peace, prosperity, security, safety look like for them at the grassroots level and then make those the international objectives as opposed to the other way around, I think that we would start to see um, a lot more organic um, action. And then the last thing uh, for the security actors is there. this will take a lot of time, but there has to be a way in which nonviolent action and protest movements aren't so scary to security actors around the world. If there was a way in which we could do a little bit more peace building about the concept of organizing, of protests, of boycotts, incidents, and the like as being really important for societies, as being one of the reasons why security actors are there to protect their individuals. I think the minute that a protest starts, you know, both the public narrative, but particularly the security narrative, is this being incredibly disruptive. It is intended to be disruptive, but if it can be a non-violent, then it can be a useful disruption as opposed to um, the type of disruption that is going to harm people. The minute that it turns violence, we do need security actors to be there to protect life, to protect property, to, um, to do the type of things to keep us all in a stable environment. But I think that there's a lot more room for cross-learning between those two communities to see the value of non-violent action and resistance.
Thank you. Um, I think uh, I will start with something that's very important is addressing trauma, especially in, in contexts where there is a lot of conflicts. Uh, trauma does uh, contribute to people uh, vulnerability to radicalized thought, and especially that we have a lot of countries that are in transition, and especially when it comes to youth. And, and I've seen this working with youth in different conflict uh, stricken countries that when they are traumatized, even if they were not as radicalized or not have no tendency to be radicalized, they become more so uh, with the trauma. The other thing is like the nonviolent resistant is not conflict resolution. It's conflict transformation. So you cannot just rely on nonviolent resistance struggle or grass movements to change everything on their own. They don't have a magical wand to shaken then everything is good they still need to have a conducive environment they bring the ball they change the game they change everything but they need other players to pick that ball and take it further so for instance in the context of sudan i think the starting with um uh, trying to uh, uh, force more freedom or more democracy and, and, and justice and accountability, which all can be encompassed under transitional justice, can be a good uh, start. Uh, you need to, there is a reward that people did that and sacrificed a lot and took the risk for a reason. So you cannot just be like, okay, great, Jubilee, we're happy, you were so peaceful, let's go back to business and just be oppressive. So we need to have, to, to, to engage the government and the authority into this re looking and redefining the social contract and the political contract is like what had led to this, how we can minimize it. People will remain in, engaged and will remain, and there would never be a shortage of reasons for people to organize. I live in the US and there's like in my city, there is like our talking list and issues never end. And that's democracy and that's life because it's gonna be boring if we're happy and there's nothing else we want to change. But we need to have an environment in which you can have this and take it further and engage with people and evolve and become better until you get to the top of the pyramid <laughs> of the self-actualization and be alive actually. So these are my two things. Third thing, please, when you deal with countries that are in conflict, be very, very, very cautious of how you approach grassroots. Grassroots are not NGOs. And please do not turn them into one. Do not monetize their activism. Do not give them money to ruin their activism. There are many other avenues where they can use your help, where you have leverage, can create more spaces, minimize the violence uh, of the state violence against them. Please, please do not turn them into NGOs or professional activists. Thank you. All right, we can take another round of, of questions. Uh, one in the back. If you could use the, use the microphone in the back. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed Ibrahim from uh, Department of Peace Operation, Islamic Law Expert. Actually, I agree with Mr. Abdelaziz about comment of the starting point is education. But I recall actually being former prosecutor from Egypt and I investigated and interrogated a lot of terrorists before that. If you see Al Zawahri, he's a dentist. Al Baghdadi, he's a teacher. Most of them are highly educated. So the issue of education here doesn't have to be ABC or XYZ, it has to be the education of human rights tolerance, accepting others, not only the normal education. Actually, that's my first point. Second, the, the source of information for new generation is not anymore school or only the society. Now most of the people I see most of the time they are covering the iPhone in their hands and the information on, online. So that's the main challenges for new, new generation. How could you filter and monitor the source of information to be sure it's not extremism education thing? I remember one of the things, I don't want to take the floor more than one minute, but one of the things most of the terrorists saying, why you commit this crime, he said, the prophet said, if you see something wrong, you should correct it by your hand or by your mouth or by your heart. And I corrected by my hand. So it's the way of messaging for the new generation of peace. Thank you very much. It's not a question, but a comment. Thank you. Hi, I'm Aliazi Al-Shibani from UNCTED. 
I had a question regarding just in general counter violence extremism activities and things such as counter narrative messaging. Um, I know a lot of states are interested in funding these programs or starting these initiatives, but I feel like how can they balance the this um, these initiatives that they they want to tackle these counter extremist uh, violence but still keep a kind of credibility where they're taken seriously because in situations where the state is not seen as maybe reliable or truthful how can they actually message their population without coming across as like policing thoughts or um, trying to brainwash their own people yeah sorry thank you and I think I might uh, take the opportunity to ask a question of the panel as well. And it, it builds on something that, that you said, Leanne, because, and, and I think in some ways it's about the relationship between prevention and response. Um, because I think one of the themes that comes up, and Christian, you spoke about this during your opening remarks, the importance of, of creating space for bringing more people around the table, whether it's civil society, traditional leaders, religious leaders, security sector, and, and having this opportunity for uh, really sort of bottom-up design of responses. And I think a second theme around this idea of, of neural pathways that Leanne and, and Jesse both spoke of, and it, it would be interesting, I think, to hear more about how you see the relationship between what sound like two different approaches and where they actually come together. And I see we have uh, one more question in the back. Hi, sorry, Allegra De Lorenzo from the Mission of the Sovereign Order of Malta. We deliver about a quarter of a billion dollars of aid every year to 120 countries, including many of the ones that you have also just mentioned you're working in. And a big issue that uh, we're seeing is how um, terrorists also use humanitarian aid camps to uh, expand their network and kind of radicalize uh, people from who we're um, kind of trying to provide the most basic needs, kind of just shelter, water, and food. And I was wondering if you had any uh, recommendations or suggestions on how to kind of prevent that sort of um, this sort of issue from continuing on, which is also causing a lot of uh, problems in terms of delivering aid, since counter-terrorist sanctions kind of are struggling also with this uh, with this issue. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right, we're going to come back to the panel then. Um, I guess we'll just do it the same way. Christian, do you want to start? I want to start by the, the, the last question. Um, I think each fragile state has uh, is fragile its own way. What we have seen in, the, for instance, the far north Cameroon about this refugee camp is not, uh, they are not areas of radicalization, but they are areas where uh, other sort of problems are created. You have, for instance, people uh, who are not refugees, but who are the neighbor of refugee camp. When they see that, they are also facing very hard times, but people in the refugee camp have all what they need. And um, when you discuss with all the, the authorities at, at, at in those areas, they say people in the refugee camp are coming from very, very difficult context. And when they arrive, there is a kind of, uh, a kind of pain relief and they start doing children. For instance, in one of the most important refugee camp in the far north Cameroon, which is called the Minawao camp, you have registered 47 births per week. So, there, this, there is other kind of problems that are created in this refugee camp, but your point is right. And uh, but for our area, it's not totally totally relevant. And uh, I think that I I, uh, I will stop here to give the others the possibility to answer. Yeah. So I want to start like answering the first question. So I totally agree with what you said. So when we were talking about the source of information, most of the people right now getting their information from Google. So for me, like if I don't know about anything, I will like in in Syria we call it Uncle Google because he can answer everything. So everyone go to Google and like right now even when I ride like on the train, all like those like little kids getting out of school, they are all on their iPhones like Snapchat and all this like 
technology and apps. And it's something was like a big problem when ISIS rise in 2014. When if you would Google anything about ISIS, you would get like all oh, ISIS propaganda. So there wasn't a way to counter ISIS material, materia and propaganda online. And that when we were like calling on Silicon Valley's like Facebook, you should do something like Twitter, you should do something and even Google. So they all developed this new kind of tools that would to, that would filter all the research. So, and they worked with my organization. We didn't, they, we didn't work like basically, but they were using our material. So they had this article or this interview. So if you would Google like how I, how I can join ISIS, you would be directed to our website or our website would come first why you don't need to join ISIS. So that was like a smart like step from this like Silicon Valley, which is like the way how most of us, if not all of us get our information or our data. And then like uh, when we when we were talking about the next generation or about education. So, yeah, when what I mean with education, of course, like not math, like, of course, it's important. Like, but besides that, when I'm talking about kids in Syria, especially in Raqqa, I wouldn't go and teach them like right now, one plus one equal two. Those people have been like dealing or with ISIS for five years, like many of them, they've been to ISIS school where they were taught ISIS ideology. So it's so important to find or to define a new kind of curriculum to deal with those kids. Because if we were not able to deal with those kids right now, those kids in the future, they would turn to be extremists themselves. So, and that's how extremism, they've been like, uh, like this radical group, groups have been alive. So those like radical group would always use like the photos of like dead people, dead kids, uh, look what like the West did to you. You need like to take your revenge back. You need like to believe in us. So if there is not enough education, I believe you will end up, as I said, with something like way worse than right now. So I would say like focusing like, yeah, more in, in a, a new education. So even here, like in the US and elsewhere, so education should be changed. Like I disagree with the education system overall because when you graduate like from like high school and you want to start life all what you know about is science math arabic well like not arabic sorry that's in syria english or whatever so languages or subjects that would be taught all over so here like i heard like that argument about like credit score like some like this country is built in your credit score and your social security number and so many people don't know about it so when i came here as a syrian and yeah right now i was explaining like the credit score to my american friend three days ago so it's something should be like in the education system because we can be like the same person and i have like a better score so i can like this get this book for like ten dollars you would have like a bad credit score you would get it for fifty dollars and we're the same bare human and the same thing so that should be within the education so i would say changing the entire education system in a good way thank you yeah I, I, uh, okay like good. one sentence the last question so it's been also a huge argument talking about like the humanitarian aid going to areas where there are extremism group so Trust me, as a Syrian and as someone have been following the situation, they would check like the government, they would check like every single thing. Like, trust me, no government, especially the US government, would put a penny if they are not sure where it would go. So sometimes like some medical thing, they would say, no, you can't send those to Syria. What if like, yeah, the one that like jihadists would use it. So everything would be like scanned thousand of times, 50,000 of times, check documented in a crazy way and when any government would notice that there is something going wrong like even like less than one percent they would cut everything very good yeah i think education is key to getting at the bottom of the pyramid that um we and discussed uh, of maslow's hierarchy as well the first question with regard to um education in general and the hadith of the prophet and uh, correcting the munkar or the evil that you see in a society first starting with the prophet saying that you should do it with your hand but the attached cause of if you are able is very important and can be exploited right and so this is one thing i want to point out is there are opportunities and there are uh, there is work in this space because not only do we need to rebuild the infrastructure of iraq and syria we also have to rebuild the intellectual infrastructure and so sometimes there's an opportunity in chaos and I don't think that we're exploiting it right now with regard to the intellectual. And I want to point out an organization that is in the audience, Ideas Beyond Borders, which is translating secular humanist works from uh, English into Arabic. 
uh, and sending them into the region and then thereby partnering with universities where they're able to build and benefit from that work and even employ their own translators. And so one of the things we do is the English language counter jihadi magazine that my organization has done and written in English is now being translated into Arabic so that we can expound upon that. And that's important work. Taps into the second question, which is the state's role in counter narrative campaigning. Um, perfect example was in the aftermath of ISIS, we all wanted to do something. We had no work. We thought the war on terror was winding down. Boom, ISIS comes from nowhere. There's no preparation, but everybody wants to counter their narrative. So think again, turn away campaign comes by this bright guy that runs the State Department, and he's online debating with jihadists. My former associate, Musa San Antonio, lures him into a Twitter direct message debate where he completely deconstructs his argument only because he tried to come at him from a very different epistemological non salafi basis. He records and screenshots all of that argument and rolls over to Facebook and it becomes one of the biggest recruitment tools because he just refuted the sheikh, who's not even a Muslim, of the State Department. And so we have to be very careful about how we allocate resources. Domestically, DHS just funded uh, counter-narrative campaigns a couple years ago where we put $10 million into the field. Over $2 million of it went to counter-narrative campaigns. I'm studying the results. They're reporting 1 million impressions on Facebook. It means nothing. In reality, the YouTube videos that they charged over $250,000 to manufacture have at most 120 views. And so the state really needs to get engaged in a smart way. GEC is kind of smart about it, and you can look into how they do things. I think that's interesting. Um, finally, just before um, passing over, uh, the question of the neural pathways, and I think it's an important one. We do... So everything in this space needs evidence base. The problem, we don't understand the limitations in social science. So if fundamentally rational actor theory in the space of violent extremism is wrong, you're going to get wrong results. And the problem on top of relying on a top-down evidence base, relying on ivory tower experts that are analyzing data and formulating qualitative analysis, if you're doing something in context in a particular space in time, it doesn't mean that by the time you publish your paper and policymakers get their hands on it, and I get it, and I'm supposed to do something within the space of CV, that the situation on the ground is anywhere near similar. It's the lag time that makes the amount of money that we allocate toward research completely useless. And it's just something that's not supposed to be said because it's cozy for people to always conclude all of their reports with recommendations, more money for more research, no money for people that are doing stuff on the ground. If you really want to solve the problem, you have to get to the roots and the people on the ground that know what's really going on. You don't need to do a study for people that are living in Sudan. They'll tell you exactly why people are radicalizing and they'll tell you why all jihad is local and you don't, they don't need to study it. You don't need to tell me what, what narratives are resonating with ISIS. We really need to fundamentally change this ivory tower approach to approaching countering violent extremism and especially in the way countering violent extremism is directly connected to counterterrorism. Um, I think a lot has been said on the first comment on education, but I do think that the role of civic education, of adult education, of specialized education, and the way in which people interact with one another and the available tools for them to be a more meaningful um, person in their own lives and a more meaningful person in their communal lives are still available options. And we, we think about a lot of early childhood education in a very specific way, but I think that when, when people are in adolescence or even in young adulthood, education has a much broader broader potential meaning. And so I think that education ends up being a catch-all in this space, but I don't want to diminish its potential for some of the, um, the civic education possibilities. On counter-messaging, I think Jesse said it much better than I could, but what I will say is that there are ways in which empowering people to develop their own positive narratives can be very empowering. And so I think even the word counter-message is, is starting to fall out of favor because it is so anti- it's trying to be antithetical to a message that already exists. And any good um, advertising executive will tell you that if you are able to like catch on to somebody's hopes and aspirations, you're going to do a much better job than saying, like, you know, don't buy my toothpaste, buy the other toothpaste. That, that type of counter message is not going to be nearly as powerful as, like, do you want a bright, shiny smile? And so it's a small analogy, but I do think that there is probably more space for the creativity and stop using the word counter message, stop using the word counter-narrative, and start empowering um, local people to, to tap into that. 
I am struggling with your question, Jake, on, on this, because I think that there's a lot of understanding the individual that can be brought into the communal peace building space. And I think the more that we understand one another's behaviors and, behaviors and aspirations and the like, those communal spaces for dialogue are also going to be strengthened as well. And so when you know that a one-on-one -on -one conversation is different than a three-on-one -on -one conversation is different than a 20-person conversation, and you can use some of that science behind how people interact as part of a peace building approach in some of those communal spaces, I think that we're going to just get a lot stronger about trying to see progress as opposed to just outputs. So I, we have a colleague at the Institute of Peace who works on inclusive peace processes and reconciliation. And I've talked to her a lot about of what can we be learning about kind of shortcuts in the brain that are going to enable us to hear different viewpoints a little bit differently, how we can actually think a little bit more about, you know, traditional, I, traditional is not even the right word, but like some of the more core peace building aspects like dialogue and mediation and negotiation, what can we be bringing to that to make them even stronger? And the last on the comments on the humanitarian aid in camps, um, you know, I spend a, a lot of time on this recently, and I think that we're at a, um, a real strategic deficit in the way in which we cover these issues. Because e if we look at the scale of humanitarian suffering that is happening around the world, it is enormous. And the scale of violent extremism or radicalization in those contexts is small. And it is scary when you see individuals that are existing in these camps that are exhibiting violent behavior, that are radicalizing and recruiting and the like. But I think the vast majority of individuals are traumatized from conflict, from civil strife. They wish that they had a future to go back to. Their towns no longer exist. And so I think that there's a, there's a huge thing that needs to happen about being able to right-size the problem so that we can actually remove security threats and help them either disengage or serve justice and accountability mechanisms for crimes committed. But we have to be able to disaggregate that from the variety of people who exist in a humanitarian situation. And our media is not helping us out by seeing these entire camps as for, filled with ISIS supporters. They are not. They are majority children. It is a kindergarten in places like El Hall. And so I think that we have a big responsibility to try and right-size the problem so that we can address the problem. There are, there are big disengagement needs. There are big accountability needs. There are people who have committed atrocities. They should be held accountable to their communities and to the international community, but they are not the majority of everybody who's there. So I, I want to talk about the idea of being about the education, whether education does contribute to being violent or more vulnerable. And I, I think I agree with the gentleman about that. Education is not everything. I think the critical thinking is is the key here. And again, at the risk of sounding like a saleswoman about nonviolent resistance, it's the What's interesting about the dynamic about nonviolent resistance is that makes you challenge what power is. And that's a very long process. It's, it's unlearning what you've been told for millennia of what is power, who has the power, what you lose and what your validation is, your identity, your belonging. That's all part of the oppressive regime. So the idea of you being in a nonviolent resistance struggle and engaging in that with that convention, convection, that you can make a difference, it requires a lot of unlearning. And unlearning is much harder than learning because you are actually shedding parts of yourself, part of your identity, and redefining the structure of how you how you interact with the with the things around you. Uh, and, and I think it really helps. And it was very interesting. I was talking to one of my friends. My, my first degree was in linguistics. And it was really interesting how young generation now in Sudan use profanity a lot. And women young women especially. And to me, it was just not about using profanity just for the sake of it or just to be rebellion. But it's just a way of breaking the gender rules, breaking of what society expects of you, redefining what is a decent girl or what is a lady like or what 
they are redefining all that. And I think, it, it, of course, this is not the ultimate goal that you use these languages, but it is part of the process of you, especially if you live in a country where validation in the culture is very important of your identity. It's very important for people in the commu communal community like that to be validated and accepted. So for you to go against the, the, the tides in a lot of, like, especially in these taboos is not something easy. So I think, one way to look into that is to cultivate like critical thinking and and what was very like disturbing is that ISIS or like all these radicalized groups what they did they used the same narrative that the oppressive regime used to be in power they used it to recruit the people because you already had that psyche that you are already receptive to religion narrative and all that and now they're using the same narrative that kept you uh, suppressed to rebel, and you need to offer something different that's more critical and challenging to, to this uh, idea of what power is. And um, I, there's a very interesting book, and I'm not trying to, uh, that's called How We Win, and it's very interesting, it's not about narrative. Nar words are used to describe what we experience. You know what I mean? You, you cannot wish a, a um, wish a reality. So it's not enough to change the narrative if what everything I see day in and day out is oppressive. It's not enough. If you don't have community resilience programs, if you're not looking into economic um, uh, uh, opportunities, if you're not lifting the repressive laws, if you're not changing that, nothing about the narrative. No matter how you change the narrative, at the end of the day, we that's we experience life. We don't talk life. We don't read life. You experience that. So it's not enough just to change the narrative. It's not enough. And actually, sometimes can be more, um, it angers people more when you tell me that it's beautiful and rosy outside and it's not. So it, it actually makes people, it fuels anger. So we don't, okay, narrative is good to do that. It's good. To, to, to counter some of the stereotypes and all that, but when it comes to brewing reasons for people to become radicalized and risk their life and risk their association with their community, you need to have to give them something that it's worth the push factors that they, they are subject to. Thank you. All right, we are at uh, quarter to three, so um, we are just about at time. I want to thank all of you. I, th I think it's been, um, it's really been quite an incredible panel. I mean, each of you brings a unique experience from a, a different part of the world, and I think listening to the complementarity between it reinforces and, and, to my mind, gives some sense of optimism that at a moment, as Terry I said, when this really is one of the biggest security challenges of our time, there are people working who have inspired ideas about what actually works, how to influence policies in a way that will have the kinds of um, holistic approaches that that, uh, that we're looking for. So I want to thank all of you for, for coming, and uh, please join me in thanking them. <laughs>